Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, thanks for dialing into another presentation today. Uh, this is our final uh, presentation of the day, last but certainly not least. Um, and I'm very excited and, and proud to have Randall Crowder here, who is the COO of Funware, uh, which is a public company, uh, trades on the NASDAQ. It's the mobile software company that leverages blockchain technology to unlock additional monetization streams through various mobile applications. Um, Randall's had a, an extensive background in, in, in tech and ventures, um, including health-related services as a founder and managing partner in, in a few different areas. Um, with that, I, I want to turn it over to Randall um, uh, to present on the company and kind of give us a little bit of an agenda here. Yeah, I appreciate it, John. So this is what I'm going to try to go through today. You know, being an ex-Army Ranger, we always do bottom line up front. Uh, talk a little bit about the history of Funware. Um, I've been known to say this, and I'm going to keep saying it because I believe it to be true. Um, the future of blockchain really rests with real companies solving real problems in the real world. And so to really understand what we're doing as it pertains to crypto today, you really got to understand, you know, the 13 year history of Funware and how we got here. Uh, we're going to talk about that problem that we've been trying to solve uh, for a major portion uh, of the better part of a decade, really. Um, why we already have a unique solution that presents a really interesting foundation for what we're doing with blockchain, the role blockchain now plays in our platform as we continue to scale and grow. Uh, give you a real world example, um, and then if there's time and, and it's warranted, uh, some Q&A at the end. So let's dive right in to be respectful of your time. I always like showing this slide up front because we're a real company. Um, everyone loves to talk about Bitcoin as like the gold standard for decentralization, but let's be honest with each other. Bitcoin only exists because of the centralized effort of a few people. There's debate who those people were, but I'm sure there were long nights and a lot of Red Bull and a lot of arguing over what that should be. And then it gave birth to something that is really transformational. And so the same thing is kind of required now. You know, whatever you're doing and innovating in blockchain, I think it has to be built through a centralized effort. There's got to be a sense of urgency. There's got to be a real team behind it. And in Funware, you have that. You know, we're a publicly traded company. Um, we're doing a lot of really exciting things in blockchain. Uh, very little debt, great resources. So over the last kind of 12 to 18 months, we've cleaned up our balance sheet, shown some really strong revenue growth uh, over the last 12 months uh, into the last quarter, doing over 280% uh, year over year growth. A lot of what we do, and I'll get to this in a second, uh, is designed for indirect channels. So if you're deploying anything innovative, you gotta be thinking, how do you scale? Uh, how do you, you know, improve those margins for us? Uh, that's indirect channels. You know, so taking advantage of these much larger partners, much larger teams, having our software be able to be easily deployed through their ecosystem is going to be key uh, to not only our success but how fast we can scale. A lot of good market attention. Um, you know, we have really strong volume and liquidity in our stock. Uh, we've been a top gainer in NASDAQ um, in terms of price appreciation and volume multiple times. And so I think a lot of people know the PHU in ticker. Uh, and so we're excited to be able to begin kind of you know, heading up and to the right uh, from where we are today uh, with a lot of kind of the foundational elements of our product um, nearing completion. And now we can just start selling and really kind of solving for the business cases. I want to talk about, you know, what role blockchain will play in that. Um, we've traditionally targeted Fortune 500 companies. And so how you know, likely are they to adopt these things? Where are they in the maturation process and thinking about blockchain? Uh, and then you know, we also did uh, acquire uh, light technology in Q4 of last year. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what role that could play, uh, both for us financially, but also strategically as it pertains to blockchain. So these are our lines of business. Uh, whenever you see us report, you'll see kind of two different flavors of revenue, platform revenue or hardware revenue. Platform would be the software subscriptions and services, the application transactions, everything we're doing around blockchain. And then obviously the hardware revenue would be everything we're doing with light. Um, small caveat to that, it's not hardware risk. We're a distributor of high performance computer parts, uh, high performance computers. And so Alienware, if you remember that, um, got bought by Dell a long time ago. That's kind of what they do. So think gamers, miners, content creators, you know, very high-end computers um, running, you know, usually complex systems. Uh, that's what they distribute. And so I'll talk about what role that could play in a decentralized data economy soon. But, you know, it's a Needham Crypto Conference, so we're going to focus uh, on this bottom left quadrant, you know, everything that we're doing around blockchain. And so to understand what we're doing in blockchain, you got to go back to the origin of Funware. Started the company back in 2009. It was 
a very different time in 2009. Less than 3% of internet content was consumed on mobile. And so large brands were just beginning to figure out web, much less what's this new thing called mobile. And so mobile apps were not a preconceived you know, conclusion. It was something that we had to really sell and let people understand what are you going to do with that mobile application. A lot of it uh, was sports media entertainment. So we built the first NFL app. We built the first NASCAR app. We built most of Fox's mobile application portfolio. We did the Sochi Olympics. We've done everything you can possibly imagine. Hotels, hospitals, stadiums, airports, malls, you name it. We have experience delivering, uh, delivering complex mobile ecosystems. Now, that's great, but you fast forward to today, everybody's got a mobile app. It's kind of become a commodity. And to be honest with you, that decade of, you know, kind of custom mobile dev experience, lower margin, non-recurring revenue, you're chasing the next thing, uh, and there's nothing rinse and repeatable about it. So we thought, what if we take everything we knew about mobile, distill that down into a platform that would allow us to license mobile software the same way you would license the CRM from Salesforce. And that's helped us usher in this next latest transformation, which aptly named is digital transformation. It's no longer good enough just to have a mobile application what are you doing with that mobile application to better engage your users? And quite frankly, you have to be thinking mobile because we live in a mobile first world that's quickly feeling like it's mobile only. Switch to advertising, because that's really the end all be all here, right? So when people are trying to engage consumers, what are they trying to do? They're trying to you know, make more money. They're trying to drive profitability. This has been a problem since the dawn of advertising. You know, Half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. That is what brands are still struggling with today. The problem is advertising as a construct is changing. Advertising used to be, let me pay for content and drive awareness. Is awareness really getting it done anymore? We live in an on-demand economy that has limited attention span. People want what they want. They want it now. And if you don't engage them when they're most likely willing to make a profitable decision, you may lose them forever and never have an opportunity to engage them. So why aren't brands doing more of this? Well, problem is, we have a very connected world. We've done that very well. IoT is a common acronym now. You have infotainment systems and cars. You've got smart speakers. Alexa keeps you know, chiming into my Zoom calls when I'm doing them from home, and I actually use this part of my pitch and say, Alexa, she's like, excuse me. And so everything seems real smart from a technology standpoint, but if you think about how you live your life, you live disconnected from a connected world. Last time you went to a grocery store, maybe you cross an RF signal to open a door. Maybe you swipe a credit card when you leave. But that stuff that you see in movies, at least for me, that's not happening. Maybe in Singapore it's happening. But at least in America, here in Austin, Texas, I live a very dumb experience. Unless I pull my phone out and do something with it, it's a paperweight. And so I don't see any holograms. I don't see any personalized advertising. I don't see anything to help me live in the real world that is feeling like it's tech enabled. We're here to solve that. And so we're trying to develop this software layer, this technology infrastructure that will allow us to bridge the gap between IoT and digital transformation, something like the internet of experiences, if you will. And so when you hear us refer to multi-screen as a service or math, that's what that is. That's an enterprise cloud platform for mobile that allows us to get the right content to the right customer on the right screen at the right time in the right place in order to drive profitability and or productivity. What that allows brands to do with us is standardize on us. So I kind of like cringe when I hear even as a service, because as a service is a product. We're more like AWS. We're a cloud infrastructure for mobile that you can standardize on. We want brands to standardize on us. Atlantis in the Bahamas just standardized on us. If you've never been down to Atlantis in the Bahamas, I you, know, you definitely recommend it. It's an amazing island in and of itself, one of the largest luxury resorts in the world. They standardize on our mobile cloud. Norfolk Southern, one of the largest railway operators in the world. They were going back into the office in a big way. They standardize on our mobile cloud. We're industry agnostic. We allow brands to get these very complex mobile ecosystems that are designed for action, to influence users and have them take actions that are beneficial to the whole. And so, one of the big things that are is a huge competitive advantage for us is this integration layer we provide. So by standardizing on our platform, just like an AWS, it almost is an interoperability layer. So for Norfolk Southern, we're, I think we're up to about 27 different integrations. They use Microsoft Teams for conferencing, Outlook for scheduling, Lutron for lighting, Carrier for heating and cooling, the list goes on and on. 
27 different integrations, different code bases, different companies, all now seamlessly integrated into our cloud layer that presents itself like a mobile application. So it feels like one product. They call it Fusion 360. When you're an employee at Norfolk Southern, download the Fusion 360 app, and with a swipe of a thumb, click of a finger, you can order office supplies, order catering, book meeting rooms, you know, find coworkers, do everything you could ever want to be in a smart workforce from one single sign-on, one seamless experience. And so we bring together all these disparate integrations into one seamless design, one seamless UX, so that it feels like one product. That's gonna be table stakes going forward. Whether you're a business like Norfolk Southern or you're a hospitality brand like Atlantis, they're all looking for ways to create interoperability across all the other vendors they already use who are more like point solutions. One of the big things that we deliver that we don't even have to integrate with because it's ours and we have IP surrounding it is location. So if you're trying to find a mobile device indoors, the same way you could find one outdoors using GPS and satellites, what do you do? GPS and satellites aren't going to help you. We solve for that. And so we actually beat Google for Kaiser Permanente's business because of our location software. And that's the idea of taking any signal strength inside a building and using it to locate a mobile device. This is huge when you start thinking about engagement. You know, you can't really engage what you can't locate. And so now as we start to think about blockchain, if everything I've been talking about is this idea of contextual engagement and we can find you and we can engage you, well, why not authenticate who we're actually engaging? And if the engagement is valuable to a brand, what's it worth to the brand? Do we want to incentivize people? These are two really interesting opportunities for blockchain to be used, what blockchain was designed to be used for. There's a lot of people chasing fads right now, and you can ask them, why blockchain? A lot of them don't need to use blockchain. They're just trying to catch the crypto wave. We're actually leveraging blockchain for its true promise and trying to commercialize blockchain-enabled features inside of our enterprise cloud platform. So we're not pivoting the business. We're not a crypto company. We're an enterprise technology company. We just happen to have features that our brands can choose or not that would upsell them into a blockchain-enabled ecosystem or blockchain-enabled capability. So what's that look like? First, let's take data. You know, in order to engage somebody, it helps to know who they are. You know, who are you? Where are you? What's important to you? How do I engage you in a meaningful way? Well, that's becoming more complicated. So if you think about what's happening with data right now, you have thought leaders, you know, calling a question into, you know, data as a human right. What are we doing around privacy? You have government leaders calling out, you know, this unfair, you know, way in which, you know, brands are basically exploiting people for their data. No one's being fairly compensated. Data is now the most valuable asset on the planet. You know, there's got to be a better way, right? Technology companies are making it harder and harder for people to leverage data to inform these real world experiences. And so what do you do? What's the answer? I'll tell you, the holy grail is first party data where consumers can manage consent and then leveraging that data to better engage those consumers. People love to buy. They hate to be sold. So what are we doing? We're building a self-sustaining virtuous ecosystem that reimagines engagement in the mobile first world by decentralizing data and empowering consumers. Said differently, I'm stealing from good to great. This is our flywheel. Everything I've been talking about at the 12 o'clock is math. Contextual engagement in a mobile first world. But one thing people don't realize about Funware is we're a data company almost masquerading as a mobile company. We had an early hypothesis and it was could we create a funware ID for every human being on the planet with a mobile device touching a network? You always need a big, hairy, audacious goal when you're trying to raise money. And so people roll your eyes and they think, oh yeah, sure, it'd be great if you could do it, but could you really? Fast forward to today, we've generated over 15 billion funware IDs. And so those are different devices that we can segment into different audiences based on all those demographics or technographics or purchase intent. And so the thought is, what do we do with it? How do we monetize it? But also, how do we turn it back over to the consumer? How do we let people truly own their data? So the first digital asset we were, we're launching is FunCoin. First publicly traded company to do it. This is a security token. So it will be launched on Securitize, a licensed ATS. Um, this is that idea of owning your data. You know, in our model, this is the gold mine. This is, 
You know, every time you click something, share something, like something, go somewhere, you're generating all this data, everything that represents you, Facebook, Google, credit agencies, all these data oligarchs, they're selling your data without any consideration being given to you, without any thought being given to you, and that's going to change over time. So fun coins are gold mine, and every time we sell data, we're able to fairly compensate users for their data. What about all that engagement? What about every time you show up somewhere or refer something or do something? How do we value that? So I'm wearing it now. That's fun token. That's our utility token in our ecosystem. And so it's a sister token, but it's totally separate. You know, Funcoin isn't you know a dividend. It's not something that you're going to get uh, shares of Funware, the mothership. Um, it's really a security token designed around owning your own data and fairly compensating people for data. That's the gold mine. Fun token then is picks and shovels. They're still valuable, but they have a function. And so rewarded surveys, rewarded videos, rewarded points of interest. Remember that. I'm going to get to that in a second with a real world example. But this idea of I want to engage you and I want to get you to do something. You know, one of our biggest industries as a company is healthcare. So tech enabling healthcare is huge. That location is a critical part of our cell because people get lost in these big distributed medical campuses. One of the things a lot of hospital administrators are struggling with is people being late or missing their appointments. And so we now have this really unique solution to not only help them find their way around a medical campus, but incentivize them to show up on time. So can we blockchain enable rewards, not just based on what you purchase, based on what you do, based on profitable behavior? That's the difference. So we got picks and shovels with a fun token, utility token, we have a gold mine with fun coin, which is a security token. Fun Wallet is a native application uh, that's on iOS and Android. You can download it today. That's where you'll manage these digital assets. That's kind of the center of gravity, if you will, for everything that we're doing. And we're really trying to kind of bring collaboration and fair compensation into the light when it comes to data and engagement and stop doing this exploitation and surveillance that most data oligarchs do today. So what does that look like in, with light? Light then provides that bridge between the Web2 data, which would melt any blockchain, and the Web3 interfaces that would leverage it. It becomes what's called a decentralized Oracle network. And so we're kind of controlling our value chain by owning the high-performance computers that will enable a lot of the function in our ecosystem. No different than what people do with Bitcoin. The only reason Bitcoin exists as internet money is because somebody invested in high-performance computers, shoved them in a warehouse, voila, you got Bitcoin. Amazon, the only reason we have cloud services is because somebody put high-performance computers, shoved them into a warehouse, and you had data centers. And so if you're going to truly decentralize something, you got to remove those central points of failure, and you got to decentralize your computing power. And so that's what we're working on with Light. Give you a real example, uh, a cruise line. Kathy Mayer sits uh, on our board. She uh, was a CMO and CDO of Carnival, and we talk about a lot, this a lot with her. Look at all these people standing in line, doing nothing. These are opportunities to engage these people while they wait to board a ship. One of the things she was always struggling with was selling more excursions. And so, you know, like, hey, how do you sell excursions today? Well, we put out signs. And if we have the staff, we kind of, you know, try to sell one to one. I'm like, well, God, people have been doing that for 100 years. You know, you got to bring this into the 21st century. With our existing technology, we could solve this. I can introduce video through the mobile app. So now instead of seeing a sign with somebody riding a horse in the ocean, you can actually watch a video. And we know that video converts at 80% higher. So let's at least start there. But she comes from the gaming industry, right? So she's thinking, well, I spent a career in Vegas at Stands and Caesars. I know my numbers. If I can get you know four people to watch the video and one of them is gonna convert and the average ticket size is 100, well, I got, I got a little bit of wiggle room to pay those other, the, all four of them to watch the video. I want to really make sure I get your attention so you're not distracted by your kid pulling on your sleeve saying they got to go to the restroom. So we started riffing on this idea of microtransactions for Fun Token. But then it's like, well, not everybody has the app. So what role does FunCoin play in that? So first, let's identify all the device IDs in and around port when you're getting ready to leave. This is what we can do with our existing application transactions business, which is all about data and rich media. Whether you have the cruise line app on your phone or not, we can identify devices in time and space, and we can try to reach them with traditional advertising, but data enriched. Or if you have the app of the cruise line you're about to board on your phone, we can now engage you directly. What will we engage you with? Well, 
We want to now remember, try to incentivize that engagement. We know it's valuable to us to get you to watch this video on all the amazing excursions you can enjoy, but now I want to incentivize you to watch the video to make sure I convert that customer. And so because of the way we design our software, because it can live within third-party mobile applications, we're not changing behavior. You're opening the same app you already had, even if you've never even heard of crypto. You're playing the video the same way you would have played it normally through a push notification. And you see where it says earn cruise coin? That's just white label fund token. That's what's really cool about this. You're not going to see cruise coin trading on Coinbase. It's just white labeled fund token so you can stay on brand, which helps us acquire customers in a more seamless way. And so now you've clicked on the button, you're standing in line, you watch the video. Now, what do you do with it? You can continue to earn while you're in the ship, maybe for dwell time. You've been in the casino for 60 minutes. You can earn some more. You can earn some for booking a reservation in a certain time slot. You can spend it while you're on the cruise ship if you like, or you say, you know what? I didn't have anything I wanted to spend it on. What do I do with it? Glad you asked. You can actually get kicked out into Fun Wallet, take custody of it, and you can do whatever you want with it. And so that's the really unique thing about these models where you can do blockchain a rewards program. You no longer have to keep it as a liability on your books. Fortune 500 businesses, at least the CFOs, take their rewards programs because you have to keep it as a liability on your books. And so we're working to try to solve that, give them a blockchain enabled loyalty and rewards ecosystem with fun token. If they already have an application and that direct line of engagement with a customer, or we can use FunCoin to acquire more customers and actually pay people for their data. And people will absolutely tell you what they want. They will hygiene and sanitize their data if you give them an efficient model to do it. Because none of these brands are you know, loyal to Facebook and Google, and none of the consumers certainly are either. You know, Being able to engage between a brand and a consumer in a trustless manner, the same way Bitcoin proved you could do it in finance, that's the holy grail for contextual engagement in a mobile first world that's levering, leveraging blockchain uh, to basically be an extension of our core capabilities. So really excited about what we're doing. Uh, everything is in process right now. We're trying to do it in a very compliant, very measured approach. Um, we think we can hopefully shine a light on what we're doing, what right looks like, uh, and not just be some fly-by-night you know, kids in Malta hiding behind an avatar trying to you know, convince the world that they're a real company real companies are going to have to solve for blockchain because this stuff is hard. Compliance is ambiguous, um, but we have the wherewithal, the resources, and the people around the table uh, to really make a splash in this area and build on top of our momentum that we've built over the last 13 years. And so love to open it up. If John, you have any questions or if anybody else has any questions, uh, happy to do that if we have some time. Yeah, yeah, we definitely, um, yeah, we have some time here. So, so happy to open it up. We've got some that come in. So, uh, we'll get to those and um, a reminder to the audience, if, if you have any uh, additional questions, please submit them. Uh, so first off, the question, one of the questions that came in asked, uh, how does Fundware, the company, monetize Fund Token and Fundcoin? Um, and can you dive into that? Great question. So now remember, we have two different, you know, digital assets is kind of the word that I think regulators and, and lawyers, you know, prefer to use these days. And so instead of crypto or anything else. So as a digital asset, we kind of have two flavors, right? Funcoin is being designed as a security token, so fully regulated. There's not many places where those can trade. There's not many places that even understand what the security token market um, will become between you and me. I think that's actually the longer term. You know, I think utility tokens and NFTs, that's my space. Security tokens is Facebook. Eventually, regulators will catch up. Eventually, you will require professionalization of everything. Security tokens allow you to take advantage of the benefits of blockchain without all the headache of this regulatory ambiguity. So we're designing Funcoin for that. That's going to be a balance sheet item. So if we do sell it, it'll have to be through a registered exemption. So we're going to file for a Reg A uh, that'll allow us to sell, up to sell or issue up to $75 million. If you go beyond that, then it's kind of like actually just taking a company public. Then you can kind of do unlimited shares, uh, un unlimited money. But for right now, we're going to start with a Reg A, which is capped at $75 million, um, and really kind of see you know, how the market responds to that. And so anytime we would sell that fun coin, that would be just a balance sheet item. It'd be non-dilutive cash. Fun token is different. Fun token is selling software. We're selling basically the function of our platform. If I want to deliver to you a rewarded survey or a rewarded video, I'm saying, 
here are zeros and ones coming to you. For you engaging, you're going to keep a portion of that. So it's earned incentive for the behavior I want to influence. And so for that, that's revenue. That's pretty much almost 100% growth margin revenue. Uh, it's, I'm selling picks and shovels, which we love, obviously. Now, granted, the, the market isn't great right now. And so we're not actively you know, marketing or trying to sell anything right now. We're really focusing on the foundational elements of our business, um, you know, how we can work with the partners we already have. Uh, it was funny. You know, so with Atlantis, how I mentioned you know, that mobile app, when we deployed that, they're licensing mobile software. But they made $50,000 through their app the first week they had it live. They made over half a million dollars through their app the first few months they had it live. So now the good idea fairy kind of goes out of her, gets out of her cage. And so it's like, hey, can we do augmented reality scavenger hunts like Pokemon Go and, you know, layer in possibly, you know, crypto into that? Uh, absolutely. Um, and so these will be longer term discussions to see where people want to infuse blockchain into their activities. But I think you have to land and expand. I don't think you can go to a Fortune 500 business right now and be like, I've got a bunch of crypto. Do you want it? Anybody who tells you that is quite frankly full of it. You know, brands are going to want to do what brands do first and foremost. They want to be able to, you know, build on top of that as an extension of a core value proposition. Um, and I think we have that kind of goodwill already with brands where we can go to them and upsell them and say, hey, um, what do you think about this? Uh, but I think that's the thing I struggle with the most in, in the industry as a whole. You know, people are being duped, quite frankly. You know, 70% of the volume that you see on these exchanges is totally fake. Uh, a lot of retail investors don't understand, you know, what wash trading is, you know, what market makers do, what synthetic volume is, why, you know, that why I can say definitively that all that, you know, that little tiny nobody coin that you can't even figure out what they do that looks like it's doing $3 million a day in trading volume. That's a market maker going from one wallet to the other, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so uh, it's a shame that there's, but that comes with any innovation. Um, there's a lot of pretenders, there's a lot of disruption, but with that um, comes a lot of opportunity. So we're trying to do it in a very measured, very compliant way um, for the long term. You know, we have a five and ten year plan, not a one year plan. So we're not actively, you know, selling it right now. We're trying to talk to some of our brands and say, okay. You know, buy some fun token, use it to influence your customer behavior, like watching videos, uh, and then let's make this part of your marketing budget. And so we're working on the product market fit to be able to do that at scale versus out there trying to just sell it to anybody. But when we do sell it, it'll be revenue, which is great. Great. Thank you for that. Let's, um, let's get to the next question, which asks, who is the closest competitor to your core product offering and how would you describe your moat? Great, great question. Um, you know, so in another, uh, make sure you go to funware.com. There's an about tab and you drop down to that. There's like three um, menu options. There's news, which is just press releases. There's videos and there's blogs. Go to the videos. Uh, and there's a lot of really good content in there. Previous um, presentations I did, forgive me for not doing it in this one, but I have a competitive landscape uh, that I always show. I'll give you the cliff notes. Um, our most direct competitor is going to be like an Accenture. It's actually not somebody with a product. And so it's going to be somebody um, who is working with a large company. Maybe that large company doesn't know about Funware. Maybe the partners at Accenture don't know about Funware because we're still small. Um, and they think, well, I need a mobile ecosystem. What do I do? Well, they'll go out and cobble together point solutions. They'll find one company that does analytics really well. They'll find one company that does location. They'll do one company that does the mobile app build. They'll do you know, one company that does the design. And they'll just cobble it all together, but it was never meant to be interoperable. And it's custom code. It's what we used to do. Um, you, a lot of things break when you do that. You're over budget, under featured, and usually unhappy. And we keep seeing that time and time again. So we're the only end-to-end -end solution that comes out of the box pre-integrated with all the features that we have. You'll see some people go, well, wait a minute. What about like React Native and Flurry and some of these? Like, There's a bunch of like templated mobile app companies out there. Those are all, you know, Emperor has no clothes. Those things are, they do not allow you to drive the complexity into the systems that we have experience with. You know, NF, the NFL, NASCAR, Fox, a hospital which needs HIPAA compliance, a public company which is thinking about SOX compliance, they are not going to deploy a mobile application with a template. You know, Norfolk Southern, 
they, they, they didn't meet any of their design or technical requirements to be able to do that. So they had to have a platform like ours, and we were the only one they found. There's actually a really great interview I'm about to publish uh, between Norfolk Southern, Diversified, which is a channel partner of ours, uh, and one of our indirect channel reps talking about that very thing. Like, hey, we really needed to solve for this. We couldn't find anybody until we found Funware. And now we can make all of the solutions that we have for our workplace interoperable under one roof. Um, that's very unique. Now, when it comes to crypto, I would say, you know, most people will probably think a basic attention token. Um, you know, obviously it has more of a focus on the desktop rather than the mobile. The other concern, I mean, world-class team, I love what they're doing. I think that there's, mo there's so much room in this space. There's so much market to be captured. Um, I want to play well with others. I would love to, you know, we've been talking about partnerships with them in different areas. Um, the one thing that always troubles me with them and where we've been designing into our system, which is a little bit of a bifurcation of the two value propositions, is how you have to acquire customers. You know, so base attention token is basically asking me to use the Brave browser and stop using Chrome. I don't want to try to convince people to stop using Chrome and Safari. That's just that's just tough. Like we are just wedded in our ways, and we want we do what we do, and it's hard to change customer behavior. Um, for us. We want to live inside of the applications people are already using. Like I'm not, we're not designing this for. If you if you remember that um, Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm chart, you have innovators, early adopters. Um, you know, if we're going to cross mainstream, you've got to get away from this only designing for the crypto community. You know, we're only designing for really smart engineers who understand about decentralized finance, and we're all DGENs, and we have all these cool little names for each other. I'm trying to get the soccer mom. I'm trying to get the banker who doesn't care about crypto, but he's already using applications in his day-to-day -day life. And I want him to be able to earn or get paid within those applications and then come into our ecosystem to take custody of what he's earned or been paid. Uh, so I can start acquiring customers inside of third-party ecosystems rather than trying to convince everybody to come adopt something that I built. I think that's a, that's a solution looking for a problem rather than infusing our capabilities into the ecosystems people are already comfortable with. Great, thank you. Um, last question asks, what is the underlying blockchain fund token is issued on and why did you go about picking that? Yeah, so it's Ethereum. Um, you know, isn't it, this is another challenge I have with blockchain in general right now. Um, you see this with everything though, and we see it in our space. You know, the thing that keeps me up at night is what we're doing is still relatively new. A lot of people don't understand how not having a mobile application is, you know, a crucial mistake. But even if you have a mobile application, how do you turn it into a mobile concierge? It can't just be a content consumption engine. And people are just kind of wrapping their brain around that, you know, Atlantis. It took them a while to wrap their brain around that. Like, you know, okay, wait a minute. Like, I can actually make money through this thing? Like, yeah, absolutely, because it's point of sale. It's point of decision making. You know, you can actually get information into the right hands at the right moment in order to do something. Um, and so a lot of people pretend like, oh, there is an Ethereum killer, and oh, look at this, and, you know, whether it's Phantom or Solana. or I mean, the world does not need another protocol. Jesus, come on. I, you know, there's so many already. Um, the infrastructure, and when I mean infrastructure, I mean really the rails of the ecosystem are just not there on anything else. You know, you go to like securitize, like, hey, you know, are you using, you know, have you spent all of your time and resources to, you know, make your platform for trading interoperable with these 20 different Ethereum killers? They're like, hell no. I mean, they're, they're venture backed. I mean, they're, they're raising money just like everybody else. They're not going to solve for every good idea theory out there with a protocol that can beat Ethereum. They solve for Ethereum first, then maybe they, you know, go on to Stellar next, or maybe they, you know, want to do Phantom or you know, who knows, but they're not doing all of them. Ethereum is the most proven, the most trusted, and, you know, really the most reliable, you know, protocol out there. And for someone like us, a public company who's got to get this right, there's just way more control we can have over it. Um, obviously, we all hate uh, gas fees. Um, you know, we won't go into a second conversation about the merge or, you know, that. But, you know, as these things get better and we think about layer two, um, we actually have our own layer two scaling inside a fund wallet. We use it not only for efficiency, but also for security. The reason why we've slow rolled our fund wallet rollout is to test 
all the security threats that we could possibly face. And there are already a bunch from bot attacks to, you know, just DDoS attacks to just I mean, anything that you could possibly imagine. We've been dealing with that, plugging holes, making sure, you know, it's dialed in. Because when you go to a Fortune 500 company and you roll something out, um, you can't afford to try it with them. It needs to be proven and it needs to work. And Ethereum gives us the best chance of being able to deliver that. Um, we'll still look at things like we've done a bridge to Polygon and there's different things in our ecosystem where maybe those transaction fees we can start to nibble away on. Um, but for right now, you know, we, we, they will go unnamed, they will go nameless for now, but we tried to partner with a few other groups that promised to be Ethereum killers who their price have been doing like this um, for the last six months. Um, they're just more very easy to work with. It's like, where you know, the, the, their reps kept kind of, you know, disappearing and new people would show up and there was no sense of urgency. And I think that's what you get um, when you're dealing with decentralization. Sometimes decentralization is cool, game-changing, global innovation. And sometimes decentralization is a rudderless ship just going around the ocean in circles, banging into rocks because nobody wants to work and nobody has any vision or mission or you know, structured organization to what they're trying to deploy. Uh, and so we're going to try to solve for that. You know, we're applying all of our resources um, and all of our wherewithal to be able to commercialize a decentralized ecosystem uh, with a little bit of centralized effort and support uh, to get it going. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, with that, we're, we're just about out of time here. So Randall from Funware, uh, I want to thank you for coming on, answering our questions presenting uh, to us. It was great, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And it's just so exciting, you know, five years ago, you didn't have many of these conferences. You know, so it's, it's nice that I think we're still in an education phase. Um, so I would encourage people to just learn, go into this space with eyes wide open. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of scams, there's a lot of frauds, you know, blockchain is a house of cards built on, you know, promise. Um, and a lot of smoke and mirrors, but it's still probably one of the greatest innovations to ever reach the global economy since the Medici's commercialized double entry accounting. It's got huge potential despite all the noise and the fraud and the scams. Um, be patient because it, it is transformational. That's great. I think it's a perfect, perfect spot for, um, for the end of the conference. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks everyone.